Welcome everyone to this second session of this two-part series. Uh, I'm so excited to chat about it because today is World Refrigeration Day. We, we planned this because we want to talk on probably, well, the greatest day in our industry, World Refrigeration Day, because we should be talking about this industry, talking about advancements like we're going to be talking about today, this uh, CO2 advancements and innovations. And what I'm really excited about is to have a conversation with this great group, Omega Solutions, good friends of mine. And we're going to do a quick introduction before we start diving into heat recovery, false loads, uh, electronic valves, many different things that you really need to know about the expanding of these new technologies, new innovations. And we're all excited about today. And I want to start off by uh, saying thank you to Steve Gill and the team at World Refrigeration Day, because we all appreciate what they have done and, and created what Steve has done and created for World Refrigeration Day, getting us noticed in the industry. We need to all promote this a bit more so other people find out about it because it's, it's only three or four years it's been running and it's something that we need to expand on. Welcome team. How, how are you guys all doing? Very good. Hello, Trevor. So, Brian, why don't I get, get you to introduce yourself? We'll get James and then Nabil do a little introduction before we kick this off. Yeah, great. Thanks, Trevor. So, yeah, hi, everybody. It's uh, Brian Churchard from Amiga Solutions. I'm MD of Amiga Solutions, working with my colleagues, Nabil Cook and James Bailey. I come from a, a service background, first and foremost, back in the day when I was uh, rattling the tool, so to speak, very proud of it. I moved into project management, then into consultancy, and then up until more recently, the last 15 years of my life was working for um, head of engineering at one of the large UK-based supermarkets. And I'm happily back into consultancy again and working with some very capable and very apt engineers um, that are teaching me a lot. So that's me, Trevor. So happy to have you, Brian. This is, this is going to be such a great conversation. James, why don't you do an introduction to yourself? Hey, thanks, Trevor. And just a quick thank you to everybody joining today. And uh, second, what you've said, you know, happy World Refrigeration Day and respect to Steve Gill and the team at World Refrigeration Day. I think fifth year now that it's going and going strong, going from strength to strength each year. I've been in the world of engineering from leaving school, which is 27 years ago, six years spent at Federal Mogul, uh, training in a tool room as a mechanical engineer latterly joining the refrigeration industry back in 20, 2002 joined the epta group george barkers in bradford where I spent a couple of years training as a design and applications engineer great background ever since 2006 i've been in the world of consulting have worked for a good number of companies had a previous uh, refrigeration consultancy and set up alongside Brian and Nabil consultancy that focuses much more wider sphere around net zero renewable technologies obviously refrigeration HVAC plays a great part in that but we also um, concentrate a lot on training and mentoring on the whole design young design engineers aspiring project managers all good in terms of just further background chartered engineer something I'm very proud of fellow of the Institute of Refrigeration the business management master's degree and picked up a lot of experience along the way so hopefully everyone enjoys today's session yeah thank you james i really appreciate that it's always good to have a conversation with you nabil why don't you introduce yourself um nabil kirk technical director at amiga solutions and infamous geek my loves in life are thermodynamics heat and mass transfer and fluid mechanics and i guess that says a lot about me I've worked in contracting, design, um, equipment sales, component sales, but now I return to my one true love consultancy. Over to you, Trevor. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And that is great. And I see Max has joined us. Max, how you doing, brother? Enjoying World Refrigeration Day? So far, so good. Why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Max Berenstein. I actually know the two gentlemen on my bottom left, uh, Brian and James. I was with Walmart for about five or six years on the energy and facilities maintenance team. Uh, I also have an appreciation for heat transfer and thermodynamics, though maybe not as extreme as we just heard. So anyway, I am uh, certainly interested in CO2 as a refrigerant. That is a 
journey that Walmart has set upon that I had a little bit of experience, at least kind of with the initial attempts. Again, observing from the side, I wasn't there myself uh, maintaining or managing it. But yeah, very much interested in this. I am uh, in search of my next professional opportunity. And I think this would be a, a good area to understand at the very least, because many companies are very interested. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining, Max. Okay, we're going to kick this off. So what CO2 energy and advancements and innovation? We've been talking and hearing about CO2 for, for many, many years, and this is not new. CO2 was on the Titanic. Okay, refrigeration. So it's, it's not a new, we all keep saying it's new, it's new, it's new. What is new is the evolution of the components, the, the design, the systems. I, I know lots of companies have been running CO2 secondary systems for over 20 years, transcritical systems for 20 years. Like it's not new. We keep saying it's new, but it, it's a technology that's evolving. And that's what we want to, we should be talking about because you'll see it from residential systems CO2 has to light commercial, to HVAC, to supermarkets, large industrial. CO2 is all over the place. It's just not as mainstream yet as the synthetics refrigerant because they had over 60, 70 years in playing field and advanced over that time. We see that advancement happening as well in our industry with these new refrigerants, CO2, low GWP refrigerants, and other natural refrigerants and James and Brian, I want you to kick it off and talk a little bit about what we're seeing for heat recovery solutions, because this is important to understand is that we've been doing heat recovery, heat reclaim here in Canada since I've been in the industry over 20 years. That's what I was learning on. But there's a difference between doing synthetic refrigerant heat recovery, we say, versus CO2. And there's advantages and maybe some disadvantages as well. Do we want to dive into that? Kick it off. I think to start off with that, Trevor, it's important to understand, and you, you did touch on it, that when we talk about technologies specifically to CO2, they are also equally technologies that can be applied to other types of technologies, whether you're looking at your hydrocarbons, your HFOs, all those types of things. But it's also understanding what the nuances and differences are in terms of how that opportunity and how those energy savings are, are captured. And then you get into a whole other world about how does one comp technology compare to another technology. So it's understood that we're talking very specifically about CO2 here. You know, we could have a lot of other conversations about other technologies and what advantages and benefits they could take. But certainly we talk about false loads, heat recovery, all those different types of things. More often than not, they can be applied to other technologies, but there are nuances specifically around CO2. So if I, if I kind of yeah. kick things off mm -hmm. and then I'll, I'll hand over to the real experts in James and Nabil, you know, when you look at heat recovery on, on systems, so look at heat recovery with a CO2 system, there's kind of two elements to it. There's the new installation, say a new store build, and then a retrospective installation. So first of all, the two are quite a bit different to, to each other in terms of what is achievable with an existing space and an existing store versus what is achievable from a new design, new installation. We know that CO2, heat, heat, you know, you get some really good high-grade heat output from a CO2 system, but you've also got to think, how much heat do I actually need inside my facility? Because you even get supermarkets, certainly in the UK, and a lot of great work's been done in actually reducing the amount of hot water, for example, these facilities need in terms of washdowns and all those types of things. So you do need to balance off between how much heat do I need versus how much heat do I think I can generate? Because you can inadvertently start generating more heat than you actually require. So you need to understand the requirements for the heat load versus the heat load output that, that any, any system um, can, can actually provide. All that said, I'll just hand over to James and Nabil now to sort of start building on that. Yeah, I think, Trevor, I think, let's go back to the early days of transcritical CO2. My early day involvement was very much, we focused on refrigeration systems and refrigeration systems only. It became quite apparent the amount of heat and the high-grade heat that is available from CO2 systems far eclipses and exceeds that of synthetic refrigerants. When I first joined the industry, heat recovery I saw systems and sort of in the 90s before my time, the industry dabbled with heat recovery. So very much on a basis of heat recovery from discharge line, coiled into a calorifier, providing a little bit of preheat, 
often at the expense of elevating the head or condensing pressure. The great thing with CO2 is throughout all the times of year, we've always got a reasonable grade. The problem is we've got so much high grade heat in the summer months, but very little, the very little need for it. We don't need it so much for space heating, hot water requirements, very much dependent on a store or a facility, whether it be wash down, whether it be for preparation, whether it be for sanitization. So we've got a very captive space. Now, brilliant if the customer's able to invest in a ground source heat pump because you've got a medium there, we can actually store that heat down. But from, from a perspective of the early days, we, we looked at the refrigeration cycle only, it became very apparent. And of course, in the world of academia and the, the experts in the field back then, we always knew that there was this high grade heat available. It's that balance point now, Trevor, that we need to look at and what we need to consider in terms of how much heat do we need and when do we need it. The harsh reality is, even with CO2, when we get into those colder months, the system's not working as hard, but we're still generating an amount of heat. So I think where this part of the conversation I think is naturally going to lead and I'm going to lean on Nabil is on how we amplify that base heat that we've already got I'm on the side of I think we grab the heat that we can grab and but we do it simply so via a plate heat exchanger let's put a clear demarcation but let that heat put a base onto a heat pump to add to reduce the amount of the reduce the amount of power input on the mechanic what is traditionally the mechanical side that's what i'm a big fan of with heat recovery let's keep it simple but there's also the other side which is systems that are complex and people would an organization would argue that false load for example isn't actually a complex technology the reality is how much heat is available to grab in those low ambient seasons and how effective is that false load actually going to be is it sufficient to be able to heat the stove whether or not we're using a, a hot gas refrig direct refrigerant cassette or whether or not we're looking at a, a more water fluid based system so i'm going to uh, hand hand across to nabil nabil experience on false load because the principles and i'm in agreement it's a great principle but in some respects, not necessarily effective and does add layers of complexity into CO2 tech. We've conducted some detailed and numerous um, technical analyses comparing a number of different heat recovery strategies and supplement heat supplement strategies on CO2 and found the premise of false load to be one of the least promising solutions in terms of its overall efficiency. Things this was compared against are just taking what you can get with no boost and having a supplementary gas boiler or air source or water source heat pump, then boosting discharge pressure and making up the supplement, then doing whole store heating with false load and also looking at gas cooler bypass potential as well. The false load variant is by no means the most efficient. We also know from the experience on site that using combined gas cooler and false load block with the false load sitting above the gas cooler is a bit of a misnomer because when you want THR off the gas cooler section to preheat that evaporator section, it's not there. And also there's the interlink of the controls if the block's performance is dictated by the gas cooler section, so that's what drives the fan speed, then how can you have any form of close control on the false load evaporator? So what we find is that it just works in fits and starts. And that also doesn't help the way that frost builds up on it. And we, we often find that these false load evaporators have a really rapid latent frost rate, un unacceptable for, for continual use in my opinion you don't want to be defrosting and sacrificing your building's heat output every hour it is it's just not on we also found that even with that gas cooler preheat air we were still finding saturated suction temperatures of minus 13 minus 14 required when the actual cabinets 
SST would be no lower than eight minus eight. So, yeah. Sounds to me like it comes really back to design, understanding the design, understanding what the customer really needs. And I think that's where we're at this tipping point with CO2 coming back to the industry. And I think that's where we really need to focus on to help a lot of people out there is that this design is very critical. It was, it, it was critical with synthetic refrigerants as well, but we had designers that spent years and years on it. And don't get me wrong, there was lots of mistakes made and I've worked on a lot of equipment that, that was poorly designed. But with the new, these new technologies, there's more electronics, there's more options and opportunities. I think we, as once again, as a global network, that we need to help each other understand that design and what the customer, like Brian said earlier, what does the customer really need at the end of the day? You don't need to sell them all these extra bells and whistles. Supply your customer with huge amount of values with the right innovations, the right solution, because CO2 has them all. As you can use CO2 really for all of them, but there's complexity and there's a lot of times, and I'm seeing this, that there's, and even the manufacturers are seeing this, that people are applying technologies to customers that is not needed in their geography location, what they're looking for. And this is where we need to come in as professionals. And so this was a great point you were putting across there in the deal that, that these false loads that potentially may be being installed are not the right fit for certain applications. Yeah, I think it comes full circle back to to my comment at the beginning. You just mentioned it again, again there, um, Trevor. And we really do need to reiterate this. You know, things that you hear about technology, about the great things it can do, it's only relevant if you actually need it in the first place. The reason I make comments about the need for hot water because a lot of facilities do actually have an all year round need for for hot water manufacturing facilities, so on and so forth. So that becomes a great opportunity where you can capture that for most of the year, especially in high ambient conditions where you can get a lot of high grade heat and hot water out of it. When you're actually talking about space heating in low ambient conditions and locations, do you see how quickly the conversation moved from heat recovery to false loads? Um, as you know, we were trying to focus on the heat recovery, but the reason it moved quickly onto a false load conversation is because when you are trying to recover heat in low ambient conditions, that's when this idea of adding a false load to an existing to a, to a system is somehow going to get you to a better place in low ambient conditions by adding the false load. But you know, this is about understanding to your point the detail of design of what it can and can't do in reality. And there are limitations. There's no two ways about it. Heat recovery has its limitations. You've got to understand space heating versus hot water. And then false load certainly has its limitations that it, it can't fix that problem of when you need heat in low ambient conditions. At the end of the day, it's low ambient conditions. If your fridge system is not running because it doesn't need to, therefore, you're not going to get as much heat out of it. It's as simple as that. But we have, you do hear a lot of myths, chews and challenges around if you add this false load, this will get rid of your problem. It's it's not really the case. Um, you do need to get into the devils in the detail of the design as to what you can and can't do. I mean, Nabil made it a very important point there is if you're if you have an external ambient condition for minus six degrees Celsius external and your display cases are evaporating at the lowest at minus six degrees Celsius, it's going to tell you straight away what your false load is going to do, which is pretty much nothing. And then you inadvertently have to start driving your system lower to try and extract some of that heat. So you really do need to understand the detail of what it is you're doing and designing. And don't, don't sell the dream to your clients and to your customers until you truly understand what it is that they need is probably my, my key. So your heat recovery, your false load, they become intrinsically linked if you're struggling to get enough heat out of a system. I do, do have a quick question there. Maybe Nabil, Brian, or James. Nabil, uh, can you uh, define exactly what a false load is for people who may not have, don't, don't really know or have not heard of false load before? Absolutely. It's an externally situated evaporator fan fin coil. It can either take the guise of a wall mounted or frame mounted cold room evaporator, or it could look like a horizontal flatbed condenser 
So it will have an expansion valve. It will have a spider with distributed capillaries, just like any other evaporator that externally situated. So the idea here is that when there's not enough load effective on the system from the sales area or from the cold rooms, we run this false load evaporator to extract heat from the external ambient environment. That was perfect. Textbook answer. I, I love that stuff. And that's why I have the experts here on the line. So this is really important, everyone, that this design, and if you're a designer, if you're an engineer, or even if you're a contractor or, or you're in the field, you need to understand this stuff. You need to understand design over the last, especially since I met James, over the last couple of years, I've been diving into engineering and designing, and I'm a way better technician now than I ever was before because I understand the design and I can have that conversation with an end user and ask the right questions on what they're looking for. So James, do you have anything else that you want to... Yeah, I think just to add, I think there's a little bit of negativity to around false load, but for all the right reasons in terms of allowing and making, like giving a suite of recommendations to allow a customer to make their own informed decision. I think let's draw back to the cost of energy. Energy is at all-time premium. Let's not forget the good side of CO2. There is always a reasonable grade and temperature of heat that can be recovered from that system. It's all about how we do that effectively and efficiently. And we've got to also consider Trevor, not to disparage you know, our amazing service base globally of refrigeration technicians, but by adding in false load and then the complex controls that sit all over them, which we're relying upon uh, signals from refrigeration, from the heating side, you know, lots of complexities. We should really be designing for a, a simplistic operation as we possibly can. And for me, with CO2, we should always take the heat that's available. But possibly, let's let's use it as a, as a simple medium for a little bit of preheat or perhaps certain times of year providing the total amount of heat that a, that a store may require for space heating or water. There's such a positive benefit in terms of heat recovery with CO2 to the point where I think it's silly not to consider it on CO2 systems. For one, our discharge temps are around 20k higher than what they would be on the equivalent compression ratio on an HFC refrigerant. And this is because CO2 has a higher ex isentropic exponent, so it generates higher discharge temps. There's your initial win. Your second win is the fact that it's got excellent properties. It's got a higher thermal conductivity than HFCs, uh, and it's got a lower viscosity. So win-win there. Furthermore, when you're operating supercritically or transcritically above the critical point, you don't have that awkward pinch point in your heat transfer profile of where you're de-superheating to your condensing temp and then you're flatlining in terms of temperature until your subcooling point, until your bubble point. With supercritical CO2, you've got one line coming this way from the discharge, and then you've got the water or air going this way from the uh, on the other side of the heat exchanger. Therefore, there's less of an awkward pinch point on that heat exchanger. So to put it simply, CO2 is really good at heat recovery. Why would we want to ignore that? Yeah, and, and I totally agree. I've, I've sat in, I've looked at studies, I looked at the numbers, I went into software with other other Niger. You can go to my YouTube ch uh, channel and check out a few of the on the CO2 refrigeration list, my playlist. And there's three or four conversations about in the middle of the winter, when you need heat, and you push, say, CO2 up into the transcritical zone, it is more efficient than pushing a synthetic system up into the higher temperatures because just like Nabil said there is you're getting more heat pounds uh you know more heat per kilowatt used and but this here all depends on the design all depends on the system and you got to make sure that you look at all those different things because if you if the design is wrong and you think you're going to get more out of a synthetic or out of a co2 system you're not your customer may pay more money in, in energy that really goes against what we're trying to do is be more environmentally friendly, be more aware of the amount of energy we're using to create refrigeration. Absolutely. I think Trevor, just to add as well, I think from my position personally, simplicity is a key. 
want to discuss potentially another pitfall. And I don't think false loads have been around too long, so I've got no evidence to back it up. But I don't with false load. Nabil intimated earlier that uh, the the frost buildup and the amount of defrost that are required. There's a lot of thermal shock potentially going on if we're using hot gas to clean to clear a defrost. That's a concern of mine, that expansion and contraction and thermal shock, because we are, we're talking about quite a range of temperatures. Some of that pipe work in that tubing is certainly exposed to. Yeah, and I totally agree. We have a question here. Go ahead, Max. Hey, hey there. Yeah, so I have heard anecdotally that uh, transcritical CO2 will overall consume more energy to accomplish refrigeration. And, and that was kind of a blanket statement without taking into account what we're talking about here, kind of the heat reclaim part. To your understanding, if, if, when, when such claims are made, do they take into account all of the sort of the additional efficiency you can squeeze out of a system through proper design, which is what you're talking about here? Or, or like, what's your sense for overall energy consumption? Like how sensitive is that to the design of the system, whether heat reclaim was there or not there? Uh, Nabil, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. I think for sure heat recovery closes that gap, Max. I think if we don't look at including heat recovery, we would probably see a 15 to 20 percent increase in energy consumption in a central European climate using CO2 versus the best um, efficiency wise of the HFC refrigerants. However, by the time you have accounted for a heating, that reduces significantly um, to probably 8 to 10% increase in overall energy expenditure for that system. So there is an increase, but it's not as severe as some people would tout or have you believe. James, want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Great answer. Great response there, Nabil. So I think first and foremost, we're in this world of net zero. And if we concentrate on Europe as a, as a region, we've got a, a large, large reliance on natural gas. And we know that we need to reduce that reliance if we're going to meet our net zero targets. And in commercial retail buildings where CO2 has been ad adopted, we could potentially, whilst there's still a CO2 emissions factor to the generation of electricity, which there will be up until we've removed our reliance on fossil fuels, where I'm going with this is we know what the CO2 emissions of natural gas is, and we're not going to be able to do anything about that. So we need to electrify. When we look at these systems in isolation, it's very important, as Nabil said, if it's refrigeration versus refrigeration, we know a well-optimized HFC system is going to be more efficient than a CO2 equivalent system. So it's very important why CO2 has such a big place. It's not just the refrigeration side of things, it's the benefits that we can harness from the heat recovery side and the optimization of that heat, whether or not it's just taking that waste heat that's available and, use, and using it to help heat away from a natural gas system another electrified heating system such as a heat pump Brian. yeah so just following on from that i think it, again it comes back to understanding the need for heat recovery so if you have a need for heat recovery and you can demonstrate that you can use that heat then the benefits are there as nabil and james has just said if you don't have a need for heat recovery then you need to be very honest about what the impacts are from a performance perspective um, because it's to Nibiel's point, you can offset some of those impacts, those, those negative energy impacts, but only if you actually need it at the end of the day. But it's horses for courses. You know, if you choose that you, you want to go down that route and you want to select your refrigerants and you select your refrigerants, then its energy profile is what it is. Um, if you do want to compare it against other technology, then you've got a decision to make and options to look into but there are certainly ways to enhance and improve the performance of a CO2 system, Max. Um, so hopefully hopefully that's answered your question. There is a, an energy deficit, an energy impact, but there are ways of pulling that back if you do need to use the heat for something. I think it's probably also been honest and worth making the point that you can recover heat off other systems as well, not just CO2, but as to the point the guys have made is that you do get much higher grade of CO2 heat which therefore becomes a greater benefit than recovering off other systems. Yeah, and a lot of times when I hear people talking about 
specifically this, oh, transcritical CO2 is more expensive and it uses more energy. Most people are talking about the most basic system in the hottest location with no new strategies like adiabatic cooling, ejectors, uh, parallel compression, all these different technologies that, that can be implemented in that keeps the systems way more efficient. So you got to ask when someone asks you that, oh, they're more, use more energy. Okay, well, what's the design? What's the system? What's the location? What's the humidity of that, that geologic? There's so many things about it. And when people use blanket statements like that, for me, I start asking why the questions. And, and a lot of times they don't know. They, it's just, I heard this. It's more, it, it uses more energy. There's both sides are going to, people that are super CO2 centric and then super low GWP or synthetic centric. They, there's both po- pros and cons to each. It's what Brian said earlier is like, what exactly does that customer need? Head to head, it all depends. It all depends. You're exactly, you're exactly right, Trevor, is that if you're looking at it from a test room lab analysis where you've got two systems as, as like for like as they can be versus what are the 101 influencing factors of the environment the system's going to go in and what is the need, what are the requirements from the customer. It's a, a pendulum swing from one end to the other in terms of what it is you're actually looking to achieve. Yeah, and I, and I had this conversation, and we'll get to you in a second, Max. I had this conversation with many, many people. Well, this is, I heard this was more efficient. No, this is more efficient. You need to break it down. You need to break it down to very, because you could have used the, be using the wrong compressor. Maybe you're using a compressor that could be a, a smaller size and you just don't know, but you know what I mean? There's so many variables. So I, I love that. Uh, Max, do you have another question? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's not like um, there are other benefits. There are other reasons you're switching or considering switching to CO2. It's not just to be more efficient, but that transparency that Brian just spoke to is really important to just know what you're getting into. Because internally in an organization, you're you're selling this change and it's a dramatic change for for a retailer. And you just don't want somebody who is not as close to the subject matter to then say, but wait a minute, you said it was going to cost me this much. Now I'm learning something different. And so that transparency and kind of getting into the details, very important up front. And I got a question here on LinkedIn, which is really good from a friend of mine, Thomas Lee. You can have the most efficient design synthetic refrigerant, the most efficient design CO2 system. But he says here, it doesn't matter if the correct equipment was recommended. If people setting it up, and setting the adjustments, do it incorrectly, you're going to be an energy, you're going to use a ton more energy. So all this stuff, and I've seen this, I've, I've been involved in say VFD retrofits where they're adding drives or digital compressors to racks to make the system more efficient. And then you go in and they're just bypassed. They run fully. uh, So I love that comment, Thomas, because you can have the most efficient, whatever refrigerant system, if the people setting it up, don't do it correctly, it's going to cost end user more money anyway. We talked a little bit about this. Let's dive a little bit more in some of the solutions, these advanced technologies, because we're moving along pretty quick here. Let's dive into a few other ones. There's parallel compressor or ejector technology. You want, want to jump on that right now? Hey, Nabil, we'll, we'll get you to start off. Okay, so we've got parallel compression, which is a method of taking the flash gas from the top of the intermediate vessel And instead of expanding it back into the empty suction, we have a separate compressor to um, discharge it um, straight up from the vessel pressure to the discharge pressure where it connects in with the discharge from the empty rack. That is um, great technology. And in high external ambient areas, it really comes into its own. So, oh, let me try and remember a study that i've seen based on the on america based on three climates in america the coldest it provided a nominal sort of two percent saving or increase in cop in the middle it was something like five percent and in the hottest ambient it was something like eight to ten percent Just to put it in perspective, when we look at it in our UK kind of central European climate, it doesn't really stack up for cooling only. Start to introduce heating into the mix again, as we just discussed, and it does start to stack up. 
So I found a three to four percent increase in net system efficiency of cooling plus heating, refrigeration plus heating using parallel compression in the UK on a convenience store sized system. Then we move on to some even fancier things. So we've got our high side ejector, which is where we use a Venturi style device, the high pressure gas cooler outlet in trains gas vapor from the suction, the empty suction and drags it up in pressure to the intermediate vessel pressure. So in effect, this high side ejector is acting as the high side valve at the same time. So then this additional vapor taken from the suction and forced into that intermediate vessel can then be fed to a bigger parallel compressor. This, again, instead of getting the MT to do a certain amount of work, we are taking work off it onto the parallel compressor with a lower compression ratio that doesn't have to work so hard, so we're saving even more energy. So what are we talking about? Well, if we've already saved somewhere between 2 and 10%, we're proportionally going to get a much smaller amount from the ejector on a cooling-only system. So probably on the 2%, we're talking fractional. And on the 5 to 10%, you might get an extra 2 to 3% from your high side ejector. That's not the only sort of ejector we've got. We've also got a liquid ejector, which instead of taking suction vapor, is able to take uh, liquid from the suction. And now you ask me, oh, Nabil, when do you ever have liquid in the, su in the suction? Well, if you design your system to have liquid in the suction, because you have got overfed evaporators flooded evaporators, basically. So what the liquid ejector does is extract liquid from the suction accumulator vessel. And again, using that gas cooler outlet at a higher pressure, entrain it up into the intermediate vessel to then give you a higher proportion of liquid in that vessel than you would have had and allow you to raise the suction of that MT load. If you are running your evaporators flooded, your evaporating temperature can rise by anything from one to three degrees dependent, therefore get a significant efficiency increase from doing that. And the lovely thing is with a liquid ejector, you can get that benefit all year round. Whereas with your high side ejector that is ambient dictated because of that gas cooler outlet temperature and pressure, with that high side ejector, you only get those significant savings in those significantly high ambient conditions. And the final type of ejector we can talk about is the low pressure ejector. This would need to be applied to uh, an LTHC booster system. So what that would do is it would entrain LT suction vapor into the HT suction effectively. Yeah, no, exactly. And once again, there's a bunch of these videos I've done with the manufacturers of these devices like Dan Foss. I know Corel has some, I think one of Bitzer brand have ejector. So you got to go do some research on this stuff. Is it going to work in your application? Is it not? Is it viable? Because even Dan Foss says a lot of people put it in the wrong application where it's not useful. And this is like all these technologies we're talking about that you need to understand that design and where it's going and what your customer really needs. James, would you like to follow up on any of that? Yeah, absolutely. So just touching on Nabil discussing liquid ejectors and the flooded evaporate system, these are great systems. These, these are systems where we can really win some on energy, but they do add degrees, layers of complexity. We're talking predominantly in the world of retail, predominantly use technologies of direct expansion. So the one area, so I'm not discounting far from it, what Nabil saying on the liquid ejector, because you do have that all season use of that technology, but concentrating on direct expansion, there is what you'd call the CO2 equator, as it were, where you know, you're going to get proportionally a lot more hours where a system is going to be transcritical in warmer climates than others, say, northern mid-Europe, which is representative of the UK. The one technology based on efficiency gains that I'm a big fan of is your parallel compressor. We know that the 
intermediate vessel, there's going to be separation between liquid and vapor. And there's always going to be an amount of vapor that which needs to be drawn back out of the receiver and fed into your MT suction line. The great thing about parallel compressor, if you're taking that condition, it's already at a higher condition. Why put it back into your regular MT suction line where the compressor might have a saturation temperature of minus six, where you can arguably have your parallel or auxiliary compressor, which you only actually have to run at minus two to get to where we need to go. So it's a win-win for me. I hear what we say, we have discussions regularly, me and Nabil, and there's definitely a cutoff point in terms of, okay, that compressor, that parallel compressor, that might cost, say, £3,000, 3,000 euros, plus there's the interconnections, the pipe works, the electrics, the controls, the commissioning, etc. So we're putting cost on the job. So what does that look like in terms of return on investment and payback? Because naturally, when we, we've always got to consider what does our customer, what are our customers' wants and needs? And irrespective of that system having a life of maybe 15 or 20 years, if we're going to introduce enhancements, and energy efficiency, improving technologies, which is where our parallel compressor and ejectors fall under. But parallel compression, in this instance, if it doesn't fit a three or four year payback, it will not often be um, it'll be discount, discounted because of the cost of the increased cost on the capital side. For me, big fan of parallel compression, but in terms of what is its actual net gain, because obviously we're not taking everything back out of that intermediate vessel we're putting it back in we're only taking a portion we're going to take a higher portion depending on an external temperature and for prolonged periods the further down the southern hemisphere that we go so that's just my additions there trevor i love it brian yeah so max has raised a point that i was going to make there is that the technologies are great and you can get the efficiencies where you see the efficiencies but as, as well as when you talk to your customer about these opportunities is also make sure that they understand the ongoing need for the service and maintenance and the and making sure that the commission system on day one, day 365 and years into the future, that the necessary requirements to keep those systems working at their optimal is always going to be taken into consideration that this isn't just a day one design, install, commission, walk away that the, they have to be, like any mechanical system has to be looked after, they have to be looked after in the appropriate way because otherwise you will get a cooling effect that you need to get your product temperature on your cases and you may be missing all these energy saving opportunities further down the line because something's not been looked after correctly, a set point's been changed, whatever it might be. And, and also controls of any refrigeration systems are critically important my years of experience and anything around refrigeration is probably its Achilles heel is control. Whether we're talking about a CO2 system or an HFC system or whatever it might be, is that if your controls aren't set up correctly from day one and then maintained for the life of that equipment, whatever the system is, it becomes a bit of a falling, a downfall to whatever technology you've invested in. So it's making sure that your service base are capable in terms of understanding the technology, understand why the equipment is there, understanding how the equipment works, and more importantly, what does it look like when it goes wrong so it can be addressed and rectified? Yeah, no, and, and I totally agree with that. And I, I think, because I have this conversation a lot, training and development is so important for our industry, but I really believe all if we work consistently and get this education into the schools, that these new people come in and this is going to be normal to them. In, in 10 or 15 years, this is going to be normal. We're talking about now it's difficult having service contractors come in. They don't understand it and it's complexity of it. Yes, it is. But I, I believe all these new people coming into the industry, if we're training them properly, educating them properly, they will be able to stick handle all of this. And it all goes back to any anything you do in life. If you're trained and developed properly, you can take on any challenge. And I, I think this is going to be the same thing in refrigeration, especially with CO2 and these, these more complex technology at this point, I believe is going to get easier and easier and the complex is going to be reduced because that's what everybody's striving, striving to do. I do have a question here that came in when James was talking about ROI. Beyond what capacity range these solutions make financial sense for an end user with the shortest 
ROI? Pretty broad question. So it is a great question, though. Yeah. Uh, traditionally, the point of cutoff was around 100 kilowatts to make any one of those listed technologies stuck up, whether that be parallel compression or any one of the ejectors. I think in subsequent years and since introduction of the single ejectors versus the multi ejector approach, actually, it has become feasible to get the right level of ROI on smaller systems, even convenient size systems of the 20 to 40 kilowatt range. We have a number of costs. We've got the cost of the parallel compressor itself and the controls and the pipe work and the wiring around it. And that could be a couple of thousand, even for a small storm. Then we've got the ejector itself. If we're talking multi-ejector, that's an outlay of four or five thousand pounds. And if it's a single ejector, um, that will only be fifteen hundred pounds. So this is how you have to start thinking about it. There's no simple answer even now. However, I know though that recent advancements, it's no longer the 100 kilowatt cutoff rule. It's, it's for, for systems where the CO2 system is significant portion of the store heating delivery, it's beginning to stack up for smaller systems. I love that. James, Brian, anything to add to that? Not from myself, Trevor. No, not for me. Awesome. So there, as you can see, this is just the beginning of the conversation. I know we do talk about this stuff consistently, but it all goes back to what we started, started with Brian, Brian brought it up is like, you really need to understand what your customer needs and find out exactly how you can support them with that. If you don't understand a technology, go learn about it a bit more, it, it, you know, reach out to us, reach out to Omega Solution, reach out to Refrigeration Mentor. We're here to help assist you to learn this stuff so you can be successful at what you do, because I've seen it many times the wrong application with the wrong equipment with the wrong this wrong that wrong provider and what we need to do is support each other because this is changing very fast and it's been changing very fast for the last six seven eight nine years for me a long time but it, it consistently you're going to see more as the regulations change f gas regulations all these regulation changes but i believe we're going to see more on the environmental side, net zero, like James talked about, zero emissions. That's where our industry is going to start to, to really evolve. And I think we're just at the beginning of that. Final thoughts, James, I'll go with you. Final thoughts from me, Trevor. I think it's just to reiterate, right technology, right application, understanding customer needs from a heat recovery versus false load perspective. I'm not discounting false load in its entirety. I just think it's highly complex. I think in low ambient conditions, that technology is going to struggle. My thoughts are always take advantage of waste heat that's available. Maybe consider elevating the amount of heat that's available for sure. From a technology perspective, absolutely. I'm all completely sold on parallel compression. Will it ever hit payback hurdle rate for a customer? I don't know, you know, the more uptake in CO2 that we're discussing today, economies of scale will come in as volume increases in terms of sales and requirements and numbers of compressors are sold, as an example. I think just one area that we didn't actually sort of touch on, which is a great energy initiative, which has been around for a number of years now, but that's a step of, step of valve expansion devices. You know, that just that precise control, at the cabinet end, if we're talking supermarkets or on a cold room cooler, precisely matching and metering the amount of refrigeration, refri refrigeration effect and refrigerant that's required to give the precise amount of cooling. I think that's another big win, not just specifically for CO2 refrigeration. Of course, it's applicable to all, but these are little quick wins that we can all take advantage of and exploit. And the cumulative benefit is that of a reduced energy consumption more stable and reliant operation for ultimately our customers who are, who are investing a lot of money in low carbon technology. Awesome. Thank you, James. Brian, final thoughts? Uh, probably two things for me is as well as know, the, know what the customer wants. Sometimes the customer doesn't know what they want. 
So that might mean that you have to delve into a bit more detail to try and help them understand where they need to be. They might not necessarily understand what their hot water requirements are, what their space heating requirements are. That requires you as a as a system designer to be able to help them get to the answer, answer that question. The second part is as we layer more of these technologies into a technology, make sure that you understand it and make sure that you understand causes and effects as the technologies start layering on top of each other because you get to a point of potentially a dim diminishing returns as you start adding too many things. So just really understand, you need to really understand what it is you're doing with the systems to make sure that the best value comes through from them. Yeah, I like that, Brian, because you think of this, a system that you designed that's going to uh, your customer, your client, what's the best that can happen with this being installed? What's the worst that could happen? And what's the most likely when you install the system into your customer? And that'll make you really think on that equipment that you're, you're designing for them. Nabil, final thoughts. Don't just reject things, but neither be a sheep and feel that you have to adopt each and every single thing that comes out or that someone else does. The way to approach this is to conduct studies that actually apply to your application, to your load profile, your location, your um, type of store, dare I say it. This is critical. Look for the persons or people within your existing supply or services chain that can help you do this properly. And if you can't find one, please come to Amiga Solutions. Yeah, this is why I have the best people in the world come into these conversations because we're here to help. We're here to help. Uh, James, how can people find Omega Solutions? Very easily, Trevor. So head to our website, www.omega-solutions.co.uk. Alternatively, reach out to our uh, LinkedIn page, which is Omega Solutions Cross Hills Limited, or direct to myself, Brian O'Neill. Always happy to talk. And contact details for, us all, for all of us are on the website too. Yeah, I love it. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, share this with someone, share it on Instagram, share it on Facebook. We need more people to understand and learn this stuff because there's a lot of people out here that want to help. We want to help. We want to help you help your customers. And this is what we do. So any final questions? I know, Max, you have one more question. I'd love for you to ask it now. Sure. I have a final thought and a question. The question is probably too long for the time we have. Brian touched on this earlier about controls. And my question was, how different are controls for a transcritical system compared to a more traditional, at least in the United States, a more traditional system? And is there a particular OEM that seems to get or be able to do this better? And one thought was, uh, you know, this conversation is very technology centric and engineering systems centric. Uh, when you get into the real world of a retail operation, there are all sorts of other factors that you have to take into account from the people who will install the system and commission it to the people who will service it, who are not necessarily one in the same, to the people who will be the beneficiaries of that system in the store, the store operators. There are so many other stakeholders who can all contribute to something not happening or not happening in the way that you intended it to happen. So anyway, that was just the thought base. That's, that's been my experience so far, that the technology is great, but you can't only be focused on that technology. Totally agree with that. Did anybody want to take on the question, Brian? Yeah, um, I'll have a go. Um, so controls are marginally more complex on CO2 because there's a requirement to control the high side valve and the flash gas return valve. And there's also the interlink between the LT compressors and the MT compressors on a booster system. So this naturally introduces a, some level of increased control requirements. Yeah. Um, in terms of manufacturers, we know very well that the likes of Danfoss, Corel and RDM are all highly competent in the area of transcritical CO2 system controls. And um, there are others as well, and that's not... Uh, um, me trying to filter anyone else out, but that's who springs to mind right now. Yeah, here, here in North America, it'd be microthermal E2, like CPC. The biggest thing is, is that, and like uh, Nabil said it there, like there's a high pressure valve control and then a by, flash gas bypass control. In your regular, here in Canada, in your regular systems, you have those devices. They're just mechanical. 
you have a high pressure valve and you have a receiver pressurization valve. So it's the same. It's a still, that's the way I think of it. Make it break it down easy. Is the controls a bit more difficult? I think they're just more. There is more. It's not that the complexity of any PNID loop is greater or, or the parameters around it. It's all the same. There is, as you say, just a couple of extra devices that need looking at. Absolutely, Trevor. Good, good way of describing it. There's just more. And I see and I see this and I hear this a lot that people are putting fear in the, the controls. They are hard. But the problem is I see an industry, people aren't spending the time to learn them. Or maybe they don't have the time to learn them. But I think that's an area that collectively we can work on a bit more. I want to thank everyone for their questions. Uh, I, like I said, please share this with other people. I appreciate your time, James, Brian, Nabil, and Max as well. Thank you for taking the time for this. And we'll see you at the next uh, session that we do. Thanks, everyone. Hey, thank you for watching this video. I do hope it is bringing you a lot of value. If you are looking to grow and build your refrigeration teams and want them to learn CO2 refrigeration, head to the refrigerationmentor.com website, click the contact us, and let us know how we can build a culture around training inside your organization. Let's get a conversation going.